If I had to pick any place to ever do a show, it would be Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. So stay with me to sample this true taste of history. I feel the presence of Thomas Jefferson every moment I move around here. Today, we're going to learn about the slave chefs that actually prepared these fantastic meals that were served here at the dining rooms in Monticello all along. Every chef has some of their favorite dishes. Today is one of my favorite. And the reason it's one of my favorite because it combines the 18th century together with the heavy influence of the West Indies. Later, I'm going to be joined with an expert that knows more about the 18th century and the slave chefs than I will ever know. Dr. Lenny Sorensen, I'm really looking forward to this experience. All right, let's get started. For this dish, the, the best thing to buy is a lamb shoulder. Now you can just buy it boneless. The reason the shoulder meat is so good because it has enough uh, muscles and a little bit of fat in it that you need. It's an, an interesting dish that it takes overnight preparation because what you want to do is you want to cut your uh, lamb into nice chunks, depending how you like it. There's again no right, no wrong. If you like it bigger, if you like it smaller, it's really not a problem. You want to cut it in chunks like so. You can also buy a boneless uh, bone in, bone it yourself, and use the bones in a stock. Not a problem at all. Just about so. And the most important part is that all the ingredients, which is very interesting in this technique, will be merged in with the meat and sit overnight. So I have a little ginger. People always have trouble peeling gingers. Just take a paring knife and just pull it down like that, or even a, a kitchen spoon, it's really easy. Just cut a few pieces, not too fine for that. Now ginger came over with all the other spices from the West Indies, some garlic, onion rough cut too, it's all together, here we go, carrot, just a quick cut. Quick chop, scallion, or green onion, or spring onion, whatever you want to call them. In there. All right, the most important part is the curry powder that you're going to put in now. You then want to mix it up gently. No salt, however, have you noticed that? Because salt acts as a, a uh, dehumidifier and makes your meat to dry. So just like that. And when you have it at this stage, it goes in the refrigerator. Minimum of six hours, ideally overnight. It will look something like so. Basically, it just gets nice marinated. Dutchie, put a little bit of butter in the dutchie. And I add everything into it. You don't want to sear it too much, you just want to get a little bit of heat on it, this is not because remember, you have the curry already in there, if you would sear too much, the curry would burn on you. Now you take it, stick it back on the rack, get it on more fire, I'll get the rest of the ingredients that go in it, which is very important, a couple of sprigs of thyme, we're going to organize it right here. Today obviously I'm blessed because I have potatoes right from the yard that uh, Peter Hatch and I dug out the other day, and they're gorgeous. I take potatoes. Cut them, and it's just a nice dice, and just like about so. The meat simmers nicely behind me. You want to make sure you don't get too much heat on that. That's why I am absolutely convinced, and I'm sure Dr. Lenny Sonson will tell me more later about it, but I'm sure this would have been a dish that it would have cooked on the stew or stove because it needs a lesser heat than an open fire. So I'm improvising a little bit. Simmer it all down to get all the goodness of the flavor coming out of the meat and not too much heat because as I said, curry is like paprika, burns real easy. Wood vegetables would have been obviously available uh, in the wood cellars, windowed very well and would have been incorporated in this dish. Turnip actually makes it nice because it's nice and sweet. So if I don't put a little turnip into it, I would do the same thing and I cut it like a potato. When they're young, you don't even have to peel them. When they're a little older, you want to peel them, but you don't have to. So this one over here, we'll just cut a little bit into it just for the flavor. And believe it or not, we are ready to top off the, uh, the West Indies lamb stew right now. Because all we're going to have to do is add into 
this bricks of time, the potatoes I cut, a little turnips that I discussed for any other root vegetables you like at this stage, and the habanero. Now, this is a whole subject to itself. Thomas Jefferson liked hot. He grew beautiful Tabasco peppers and cayenne peppers. And out there right now in the garden, you have bird peppers and all kinds of beautiful peppers. For this recipe today, I'm using the habanero pepper, one of the hottest peppers in the world and potent. So one recommendation I have, we can do one thing. You can take the pepper and basically just penetrate, like so, the outer skin and throw the whole pepper into it. But it's easy and the heat still comes out, but you can fish out the pepper. So if somebody has a, a, an allergy or is sensitive to heat, it's easy to do. Uh, let's follow me over while I finish up that stew. As I said several times before, I am just absolutely amazed over the firepower and this fireplace and the, the draft it has. It's just absolutely spectacular. And my congratulations to the people that uh, reconstructed it. Add some water into it. You don't need any. You need anything else, just that water. And now you need about uh, 45 minutes. Not even that. When the potatoes are done, your lamb stew is equally done. The popular historian David McCullough uh, gave a speech to his daughter's graduation and he urged the graduates to go see the world, to walk the streets of Edinburgh, to see the pyramids, to go to the Taj Mahal. But he said, go to Monticello and especially go to the Monticello Vegetable Garden because he said, there you see patriotism in a plant. And that's very much a, sort of Jefferson's worldview is that he could transform the socio and economic culture of the day by, you know, trying one of these new asparagus varieties or growing peanuts in his garden. Although Jefferson was the author of the words that all men are created equal, when it came to Monticello, he too enslaved workers. Yet in these gardens, which both master and slave tended on their knees, they found common ground. A great metaphor for this garden is a recipe in the family papers for, um, for okra soup. And you have uh, vegetables like simlins or patty pan squash and lima beans that were grown by American Indians when the first Europeans came here. There were Andean potatoes that uh, were introduced early in the Northern Europe. There were tomatoes that came from Central America and were grown in the Mediterranean. Okra, an African plant, brought it all together and then all brought together in the uh, kitchen at Monticello by African American chefs. What's really interesting is that uh, you know, the Jefferson bought vegetables from slaves mm -hmm. who had their own gardens, and they tended to be purchased out of season. Gotcha. And if you look at the products in the Monticello uh, basement, in the cellars, it's a lot of this exotic stuff, parmesan cheese and olives mm -hmm. and, and um, mustard, but uh, not many vegetables. And they did preserve vegetables, but you see that particularly from the slave gardens where you'd see a cabbage that was purchased out of season or apples that were bought in April or a cucumber that was purchased one January. Mm. So that's kind of interesting that there may have been relied more on, on slave uh, culture to uh, preserve a lot of more common vegetables. The Monticello enslaved people raised their own vegetables and sold them to the women of the Monticello of Jefferson's household. And in this little notebook, which belonged to Martha Jefferson Randolph, we see that she has bought cucumbers from Wormley Hughes in December. And then on the 29th, he sold 43 fish. Wormley Hughes, the head gardener, was able to save those cucumbers and sell them to the family many months after they were ripe. And they were probably stored in this vessel and kept cool. What have you got here? Some peanuts. Peanuts are a fascinating plant. The name peanut hadn't even come around in Jefferson's day. He referred to them as peendars, P-E-E-N-D-A-R-S. -E -E they sort of originated in slave gardens in America. Now, of course, they're an American icon. And they're a fascinating plant. And there's a story about how slaves would hide the peanuts from their masters because the flowers form at the top of the plant and then they dip into the ground and form the peanuts in the ground, but they don't start off that way. So it was a way for some people said that it was sort of a slave's way of hiding growing this food from their masters. None of his ideas would have been possible, of course, without the enslaved people, the more than 130 people on average employed here in any year. And they lived all across the Monticello plantation, and they were the people, the men, women, and children, who made his vision possible. Now I'm starting the accompaniment, which is the rice pilaf, with, done with vegetables, again there 
with a garden like that, the sky is the limit. You don't have to just be content with a few onions, a little carrots, and some mushrooms. You can go wild. Anything that you feel like having in your rice, you can put in your rice. It's very simple. And the recipe is very simple. It's two cups of rice, or one cup of rice, one cup of stock. A chicken stock, beef stock, any stock. If you like to make a vegetarian, just a vegetable stock. It's very simple, very easy, nothing to it. What I'm doing right now, I have a, a pot that I'm going to get under fire in a second. But let me get the mise en place ready. And this is, I cut a few, few mushrooms real quick. Those are just regular button mushrooms. I gotta get, here we go, carrot. And you can cut that either way you wanna do it. I happen to like uh, mine cut in a chulien, which means it's a strip. It looks a little nicer when it comes out of the, when it comes out of the rice. So it's not like, it's identifiable, beautiful. The onions, I just make it a rough, uh, 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 Rough cut, like about so. Let me get my pot over here real quick. And basically, all you do, a little bit of butter in here. You can also use oil. Oil is good. You don't have to have butter, butter oil. Throw in the vegetables. Now I'm gonna add my rice into it, and like I said earlier, the measurements were easy. One cup rice, one cup liquid. Put the rice into it, and now I'm gonna take this entire pot, put it on the fire, and just kind of wilt down the vegetable and the rice a little bit. Rice on here. Stoke my fire real good, so I have nice firepower. We've been cooking this kitchen the last several days, but now it's time for us to really understand and demystify what happened in the 18th century kitchen. Dr. Lenny Sorensen, an expert on the slave chefs here in Monticello, is going to show us what the life was all about, producing this great quality food. This kitchen, as you can well imagine, yeah. was full of action all the time. It's Fires on all day, a lovely breakfast, and then of course a dinner yeah. served every day. And how people knew how the dishes would be prepared, what the timing was for each of these often very yeah. delicate dishes Absolutely. was the clock. They knew how to judge the fine tuning of these cream dishes or other kinds of preparations mm -hmm. using this clock. And it accompanied, of course, these fabulous, what to our eye are these fabulous copper pots. Every chef's dream, and I gotta have one of those. <laughs> the high standards that Thomas Jefferson has set, as we know, had to put a tremendous amount of pressure on the support staff of this Monticello yeah. because obviously he was spoiled traveling to Europe, being in France, being entertained by the best. Mm -hmm. So his expectation would have been way up That's there. Right. And obviously James Hemmings had met those expectations. Sure. He comes back, he teaches Peter, who surely must yeah. have risen uh, to the occasion. Sure. So they had this world of work in this room and just to the side here, is what we call the cook's room and was a dwelling place mm -hmm. for probably the head cook. But the cooks needed to be near where they worked. Sure. They were on call all the time. It wasn't just that breakfast and those wonderful right. dinners, mm -hmm. but food for invalids, sure. uh, emergencies in the middle of the night. They might not have spent a great deal of time in here except to sleep. This entire area would have been full of action. Firewood in, ashes out, animals to be cut apart and put into the smokehouse. This is the intersection of, mm -hmm. of the vortex of stuff coming in. But it was coming in internationally as well, which are very well. Madeira, yeah, yeah, yeah. olive oil, olives, yeah. Parmesan, Parmesan cheese. Yeah. We see the list of all the things mm -hmm. that Jefferson wanted to have as part of his cuisine and that the cooks were very capable of using. You take it for granted when you go to a store and you buy a, a loaf of bread and it's there. You don't realize that you worry about the mill, the flour, the, the, wheat, the, the eggs. wood, the, wood the, thing, the eggs. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's what I like so much about it. And this frugality should come back a little bit more. All right, we are in the final stages of this great rice pilaf. Yep. So, how more appropriate, let me show the audience, if you want to give me this pot over there with the chicken stock in it, I want to show what's done. I see, you see how I, how I kind of saute the rice, just a little yeah. bit of butter or oil. Almost a little uh -huh. brown on the bottom. And then what I'll do is I put in my bay leaf, I put in the chicken stock, And the sizzle. Yeah. 
the 18th century, we were working and rolling. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, speak of time, Dr. if you want to do this for me quick. And then I'll stick in a little bit of parsley really quick. A little bit of parsley, really rough chap. And there's no better parsley than I've ever laid eyes on than the one in the gardens of Monticello, I'll tell you that. I mean, that's unbelievable. You got like so. Yeah. Now this goes under fire and this is eight to 10 minute max and okay. it's done. Okay. Food is surrounded by myth and because it's such a subjective yeah. event. Certainly, I think Jefferson was wanting to find upland rice, a kind of rice that could be cultivated without all that water. Well, he was the visionary, always looking for new things, experimenting, yeah. make it happen. Rice is the same thing. But tell me, Doctor, the, the story that uh, his story books read about him smuggling it out of Piedmont, is that... Uh <laughs> um, I'm not exactly sure, but <laughs> if, if it was, it certainly is kind of the first case of one of the f first cases of uh, what we call <laughs> industrial espionage. Um, there were rules and strictures about what you could Big take time. across borders, and he may very well have kind of pushed the envelope. I'm not exa I, I'm ready to let that <laughs> myth stand because it's wonderful. When, when I first read it, it reminded me of uh, an episode where I smuggled Porsche Renouveau <laughs> out of Burgundy a <laughs> okay. long time ago and it was completely illegal in the back of a car and the French go down it. So I can see it. For the cause of good food, it's really not stealing, it's uh, anyway, organizing. Gardeners. <laughs> have probably <laughs> always uh, reached over and grabbed the odd dried seed pod and stuck it in their pocket since time immemorial. All right, doctor, let's see my handiwork. Now <coughs> comes the moment of truth. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Voila! Woo! Look at that. I Isn't love it, beautiful? I love it. Okay. Isn't it beautiful? Yes. Oh, taste. Oh. oh. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, James. After all, they're the one that made it happen. Absolutely. <laughs> the boss mm -hmm. just said, give me, give me. Beautiful. Isn't and it good? they knew, after long experience, eight years at the president's house, 16 years in this kitchen, they knew what Material. was needed and wanted at the table, how it came together, what kind of ingredients had to be added or were available. Uh, it, both in the garden and in the storerooms, and put together uh, dishes that, that were always appropriate uh, for the table. You know, Doctor, while I'm plating that, I just uh, have one question for you. I have so many questions, but one is, in the Jefferson Papers you read that uh, he saw that rice wasn't popular in Europe, American rice, because it was inferior. Found out much later, had not been inferior, they had to do with the middleman, is it? I can easily believe that. And just the sheer difficulties of transportation when everything went by water. Yeah. Everything had to be barreled. If there was any uh, uh, storms or interference that interrupted the commercial chain, it added to the price of things. One, two, three, I'm gonna do them like so. This is one of my favorite garnishes. I mean, I came to Monticello first day a couple days ago, and I walked through the garden, I saw all the chai flowers, I said, God, I'm a blessed. Because normally I gotta go to an Asian market, I buy it, I gotta sit them in my house, make sure they open up so I can use them for garnishing. <laughs> but there's nothing more, oh, more sensuous yeah. to me than a little chai flower on top of a beautiful peel of a doing here. I'm gonna cut it. just a little bit of chives to, in keeping with the chives. Yes. But chives is so beautiful. They are. It's the onion flavor to it, it's pungent, just a little bit like that. And there's something uh, about the sprinkling. <laughs> That's equally really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, food and history and other parts are so intertwined. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, here we go. Oh, oh beautiful. That's. Am I going to be greedy? If yeah, I no, no, you have fortune? to. You have to. You have to. A piece of the meat. I wanted to taste that broth first. Oh, oh it's. <clears throat> All right. Really. I don't, I don't get better than good. that. Good. It don't oh. get better, isn't it no, good? No. Isn't it? Absolutely I mean, fabulous. There's two, two things together. Oh. Mm -hmm. Now, Look of course, at, at a meal in the dining room, Edith and Francis would have been preparing perhaps in four or six, six or yeah. eight different um, uh, like dishes that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, that would complement each other. That would uh, be could be laid out on the on the table or brought in uh, for one meal. And then, of course, you had dessert which we're obviously not even going to get to, no, no, uh, but today. that was an extremely important part of any meal. Isn't that beautiful though? Mm. But I tell you. Oh, be still my heart. Guess what I have in front of me? A bottle of your Sancho Vese. This is a two or three. 
and even have a Jefferson cup. And what we got to do, you and I, we got to toast okay. to the man. And obviously, you and I will toast to the people that make it happen. Okay. So you be first, and I be second. Oh. And I second you. <laughs> it, well, yes. Well, um, that is a beautiful that wine. That is really, it? yes. And I understand the winemaker is uh, part of the, the staff at We are so fortunate. Yeah, you, you are, you are fortunate. <laughs> we are so fortunate. Before I get too much involved in San Chiuese, we have one more dish to make, you and I. Breaking in a new stove but, is always an exciting it, thing, but breaking in a stew stove from the 18th century and Thomas Jefferson recreation is yeah, such a You don't get that chance very no, often. No, no, history is being made. That's right. <laughs> Today. What we're going to prepare yeah. is Mary Randolph's mm -hmm. very simple recipe for mushrooms. And she shared her cookbook with Thomas Jefferson and he uh, uh, remarked on it and had a copy of it in his library. And this is such a simple uh, accompaniment to any wonderful dinner and it is literally mushrooms sautéed very lightly. But like, you, like you mentioned, Doctor, earlier, with all the French uh, recipes and the techniques, this stove was an essential part of this kitchen. Yes, if you had the right kind yeah. of trivet, you could, you could put that yeah. pan high uh, enough for the, yeah. the, the slightest heat for a cream or other kind of yeah. very delicate presentation. She says to put the mushrooms in, Salt. Lightly strew yeah. them, was yeah. the wonderful word, with salt. What happens when you put the salt in it, then you get the liquid out. And then while that's doing, we're going to make a little, make a little what uh, she little calls, gourmandier. mix brown flour and butter. Which you know is very close to the Creole cooking because mm -hmm. the brown flour is used in, in fillets and, and in jambalayas yeah. and for the roux. But yeah. this is a dry, yeah. a, a dry uh, flour. A little pepper in that Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. So we're going to just kind of shake a little, shake a little bit. bit. These mushrooms won't be soft. Uh, she has a version of this that you do the same thing to the mushrooms and then you broil it, which she would have had to do in another setup yep. on the hearth uh, where they would have had a kind of a, a, a little brown, round. Yeah, a, little, a little shot there. Oh, yeah. And now we're going to add our, our, yeah, our brown down, yeah. butter flour. And we're going to stew it up. Stew it up. And oh boy. Looking good. So this food had to go, once it was prepared, it would be plated and then accompanied by the chef uh, and probably her helpers and a number of helpers, the dishes of plated food uh, could be then taken Beautiful flavor. Uh, up the underground all weather passage to be uh, further plated and go up to the dining room. Yeah. There were days in which all eight stew stoves, uh, stew would holes, gone. would have been operating because uh, more than just uh, the, the simple preparations that we have here, if you replicate that three or four times, that's what would have happened every single day. You know, Doctor, I experiment with those uh, back in Philadelphia before coming here, and I am convinced this isn't the last time I'm going to use brown flour in, in a roux combination because the flavor you get of it is just, I mean, look yeah, how simple really it is. really rich. It's mushroom, it's a little bit of butter, salt, pepper, the roux, I mean, what we call a beurre butter and flour again, and a bit of red wine. What a beautiful flavor. All right, Doctor, okay. we done? Let's plate it up. Let's get her on here. Yeah, yeah. Get up. We can garnish a little sprig of something, whatever you like. Or maybe nothing even so beautiful by itself. Uh, a little piece of green is always yeah. lovely. You want some parsley from the, from yeah. the garden? Beauty. Yes. Fantastic meal. Absolutely Mushrooms. Lovely. The nice vegetable rice with all the vegetables from the garden and obviously the West Indian curried lamb that is uh, just divine. Dr. Sorensen, thank you very much for making our visit so special here to Monticello. You're very welcome. And thank you for joining us in Monticello for a Taste of History. <laughs>